Jackie and Chad on Score North and scorenorth.com. To be honest, I'd love for Duran to throw, you know, every day and give him two innings and, and let him pitch. Um, he's, you know, turning into one of the one of the best young relievers in the game is what he's turning into. Um, when you throw him in the eighth, you, you do want to throw him in the ninth because um, he's been dominant for most of his most of his time on the mound for us. Um, but also, he threw two innings two days ago. Um, and you don't know what happens. You start leaving a guy in there in a second inning of work. Um, couldn't. We realistically can't let his pitch count get up into the 30s for you know the second time in three days. All right, Rocco, <laughs> sort of ju- justifying his his decision to bring in Caleb Thielbar for a successful save, the first ever career save, mind you. If you just real quick too, if you guys are looking for our full recap of the Timberwolves draft on Thursday night. We did an immediate reaction episode that you can find on the Maggie and Jed podcast feed, Scorn with YouTube channel. So, so check that out. But this is Feedback Friday here, where we dive into all the different emails you send us to the Scorn Earth app. The sometimes we even dive into Reddit, like we're going to today for something oh. Judd said, and we make the show all about your comments, questions, concerns, critiques here. And so, boys, let's let's start with this one because I know I know Judd was was bewildered by this, and I was sort of too. Josh Carey via the Score North app says, As you may know already, I try to be a Twins optimist, but after watching that one nothing win, I think it's time to analyze if Rocco is losing the clubhouse yet again in 2022. Regardless of the one nothing win, how does Rocco pull Duran with one out in the ninth for a guy with an ERA north of six? Upon entering, Thielbar gives up a double, then tries to throw away the lead with a bad throw, gets bailed out by Miranda's stellar defense, the scoop he made. Uh, then strikes out one lefty, and we're supposed to praise Rocco for his analytical foresight. What are your thoughts? Um, that clip that Declan just played to begin the show is all you need to see, and I will say it again. Rocco goes and takes Duran out. Rocco does not control that move completely. He is doing, he's basically saying, of course I want him to pitch. Like, listen to him. This is basically the hostage saying, I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Don't worry about me. Seriously. Blink this, twice if you yes, are being controlled a, by Thad and we Derek. Are, we are being, we are being, well, and beyond that, there's all of these guys who sit there and watch the game and crunch. This is this is 100% to me a predetermined decision by a group of people that goes well beyond one guy. So Rocco, yes, he goes out and takes the guy out and event and essentially, or I think he did just flat out get booed for it, which is fine. But Rocco, and he said this a couple weeks ago about something else. He said something about we and the decision. He's making it very clear. I ain't doing this by myself, folks. I mean, yeah, I don't he, like it, but it's not just his decision. Yeah, I'm trying to think back to you know Ron Gardenhire post game press conferences and Paul Molitor, you know the the previous two Twins managers, and it was never a. I don't think it was ever really a we decision with Gardy. It was I, or if he was if he said we, it was like him and Rick Anderson making a decision, not him and. Correct. They didn't have any. They had one analytics guy in their front office, so they, there wasn't a we. <laughs> and Terry Terry wasn't sitting up there with, you know, baseball savant and a spreadsheet open, radioing down. Okay, let's, uh, the analytics say that uh, we should pull our stud right-handed pitcher. This is where I will I will listen to a discussion about workload here. I'm not gonna. I was perplexed by it, but he he threw two innings, 48 hours prior. Actually, less than that because it was a day game yesterday. So he threw two innings, like you know, 40 hours prior, or whatever it was. Right. And so I get that you don't just want to be stacking. You can't go two innings, day off, two innings, day off, because you're going to wind up pitching, well, I guess you'd be pitching 160 innings in that case, wouldn't you? So you're not going to run a reliever up. Is my math right on that? If you pitched, I guess you'd pitch. You're the math guy, dude. So 160 games. If you pitched in 81 games and two innings every time, you would pitch 162 innings, which is... You're trying to keep your relievers in that 60 to 80 inning range. If the pitcher left Baltimore at 7 a.m. <laughs> yeah. and arrived yeah. in Los Angeles, horse. yes. Yeah. How From fast did the pitcher out. travel and what was the workload? The pitcher leaves town on a Friday. He returns three days later on a Friday. God, I hated those. 
Yeah, I, just, I, I did too. It's like just, just so stupid. Just shut up. It's so stupid. How's that horse's helping me? Name is Friday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is he good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just you know what? Shove it and shut up. So from a workload perspective, I get that it's not sustainable to just keep running a guy out there every other day for two innings at a time. But right. then if you just look at yesterday, you're you're. You're pulling by far the best reliever in your bullpen with two outs to go. He just powered through the first, you know, portion of his workload for the day, and you're bringing in a guy who's really struggling, Caleb Thielbar, with an ERA north of six, like the the commenter said. And you're bringing him in because well, you got two lefties over the next three batters, and so this is a favorable matchup. But I think was it Jimenez that doubled down the who hit the who doubled yes. for the Guardian? Was it? I yes. think it was Jimenez. It was. And uh, he's actually a really good hitter against left left-handed pitching, so I don't know. I don't know that it made analytical sense. I think you could have just is was there a, a better reliever in that spot to bring? It worked ultimately, but I don't know. It felt like an overthink to me. Just leave your stud pitcher in there and give him two days rest or something. I mean, I, I tweeted this out when it was happening too, and I just didn't understand it because Duran is obviously your best reliever, and he's throwing just absolutely fireballs down the, down the middle of the plate that no one can hit right, and. Even though Thielbar, left-handed hitters hit him, you know, lower than Duran, well, they're still getting on base at a higher percentage than Duran. So, like, Thielbar coming in makes no analytical sense, no statistical real sense. It was the classic gut feeling of lefty versus lefty, but I'll take my chances with the 100-mile-an-hour arm thrower over Caleb Thielbar, who was honestly just a guy in that bullpen. I didn't understand it at all. Right, they... Mm. But they're saying they're legit concerned about workload. So, yeah, and that's and they should be, they should be. Duran's had some injury issues, so I don't know. I thought they over they overthought it a little bit, but you no, know, whatever. They won. They avoided the sweep. They're still uh, seven games over five hundred here. All right, the next comment. Mm -hmm. A lot of lot of a lot of twins angst here from people. Uh, this is people reacting to Judd angst on Reddit. Judd, awesome. you got roasted on Reddit last week. For I'm your take, so excited to hear this. For your take on pitch framing. So there was an entirely new thread created uh, based off this Judd tweet on Reddit. Yes, Latroy Hawkins is exactly right, Judd tweeted. Jeffers is gaslighting umps, and anyone who appreciates his baseball relocation program is gaslighting fans. The answer is to tell catchers if they move their glove... It's an automatic ball. I can think of better answers than that, but we'll get back to that. Uh, here are just some of the comments that people threw out on Reddit about this Judd pitch framing gaslighting Which, by the way, take. has been a season long. I think, I think I'm into my second year of, of this, you are. and I've tweeted it, and until now, it hadn't picked up steam. So thank you. I'm glad I finally got some steam. This has to be one of Judd's more amusing and ridiculous takes. <laughs> I felt like I spent five minutes trying to decipher how any of this is actually gaslighting and why he used the term gaslighting 17 times in a single tweet. It was only twice. I'll have you know. Thank you. It's a lot, though. You only get a certain amount of characters, and gaslighting is a long word. You're up to 250 now, though, right? Uh, it's 280. Uh, 280. Yeah, 280. Yeah, so, like, I got room. I, I got room yeah. to paint. This feels like a reach, Judd. I think he's just grasping at straws because he doesn't know where to throw his twins' hate since Miguel Sano has been injured for so long. <laughs> I sort of like that one. Not I might lie. care more about Judd's opinion if I had ever heard of the dude before this post. True. Bro's okay. name is Judd Zolgad. He was born angry. Yeah, that's my favorite one. That's also a good one. You see, this is why I love this, I love this stuff. Well, okay. What I don't get about this is why are you putting your you're taking an imperfect balls and strike system and you're taking your angst and you're putting it on catchers. Yeah. Well, no, I'm putting it on a system that allows you pitch framing. Okay. Let's break down what it is. Okay. It's called framing. Framing is an art. Framing is subtle movements of a pitch that's close to the strike zone to get it into the strike zone. Watch what catchers do now. They literally take every pitch and relocate it into the box. That's not framing. That's finger painting. All right? That's finger painting. So if I so if you frame correctly and I'm an um I I should have been more exact with my wording here. If you frame correctly and you're an ump, I appreciate that. I might call it a strike. 
Ryan Jeffers literally takes pitches, and this is where the framing stats now fall short and need to be rethought. Ryan Jeffers will take a pitch that is well outside the box, and he's not he is by far and away not the only catcher to do this, and he will relocate it into the box. That's not framing. That's relocation of, of the ball. And the framing, what they need to do is come up with at least two to three different types of framing stats, which is one, framing. That's an art. I appreciate that. I love that. But when you're yanking the ball around, that needs to be put, pointed out. And that is actually, in my opinion, a shortcoming of the system because it's now gotten out of hand. Judd, there's a headline last week. I'm going to read this to you. Google engineer warns new AI robot has come to life. We have created robots that are becoming human-like. Oh, I, I know where you're going. And you are sitting here arguing yep. about well if the catcher where the, the catcher hey. moves his glove two inches this way then it should be this why do we even have this system <laughs> still in 2022 <laughs> we're creating human-like robots we have self-driving vehicles oh but it's hard to adjust for the height of a batter on an electronic strike zone the whole thing is ridiculous and we shouldn't be blaming catchers catchers are just doing what they need to do i mean maybe then maybe some of them aren't great at it but Okay, I guess if I need to trick you, these idiots like Angel Hernandez who can't see the strike zone, so I'm going to have to trick you a little bit because Major League Baseball refuses to use technology that was available 15 years ago. We were putting, I think, I think we were putting K boxes on TV screens in the early 2000s. So for 20 years, you tell me Fox and ESPN have had the technology to do something like this for 20 years, but Major League Baseball still has this system where. Angel Hernandez is eyeballing a 96 mile an hour moving pitch on the outside corner while a catcher tries to trick him. I just find it funny that you're sitting here blaming catchers for doing the, the, this is ridiculous. Just put an electronic strike zone in and those I guys did, can sit back there with a cocktail in their hand. They can sit cross legged awesome. for all that matters unless there's a runner on base. I agree completely, but you know what? Until we do, I don't want, and by, and by the way, the one thing about the, my thread that caught, um, that caught fire, which I really appreciate, was this. Latroy Hawkins was the one who was complaining. And basically, I think, saying the same thing that you're saying, Phil, which is, this is ridiculous. Because Dick's like, oh, look at look at what Jeffers did. Look at that beautiful Jeff. And Latroy Hawkins is like, no, he's not. He's saying exactly what, what Phil j just said. He is fooling the umpire into thinking a pitch that was nowhere near the strike zone was a strike. Well, did, so, if, well if, it, if it works, then he's doing a good job. Are you saying that he's... He, he wasn't, I'm he, saying, he, he, Jeffers actually steals more calls I know. than all but like six catchers in baseball. So he's actually one of the better guys at he doing is, this. Which is why I want the statistic redone to show how bad the umpire is when because what he's doing is he is he is doing it at a level that's not framing. So what I want is and and you're right. Ultimately, let's get the best balls and strikes. Well, no, we your tweet is can. blaming the catcher. You're saying the yeah, answer is to the tell catcher. catchers if they move their glove, it's a yeah, ball. I'm saying, well, that's I'm ridiculous. Saying, which is preposterous. No, 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 you guys. I'm saying it's one of the ugliest, stupidest things I've seen. He's not framing. He is relocating the ball, and everyone's a moron for buying into it. That's what I'm saying. But, and Ryan Jeffers. But and, it works. But they, right, which is why I would say, Ryan, when your glove moves as much as your glove moves now, that's a ball unless you hold it where it's – and if well, you no, can the, suddenly the, move the, it, the, if, but if you a, can suddenly move it, but you can't just take it from – it's over here. Okay, watch this. <laughs> Okay, I'm out of the picture right now. This okay? is borderline Judd Anthony in, Rizzo on the tarp take from five years ago. Which was one of the stupidest things I've seen. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this what I'm saying is this is incredibly flawed. It's a bunch of crap. I've seen framing. Framing is beautiful. This is finger painting. Judd, Ryan Jeffers is one of the best in baseball at converting balls to strikes and and if you're an idiot, getting what he his is. pitcher needs. If you're an idiot, the you're buying here to do it. Well, well, well then they're the, idiots. The, the umpires aren't then, idiots because it, it's really hard to call. These pitches are flying 97 miles right. an hour with movement. Exactly. It is but an you know impossible what you ask to tell these umpires to call you know these you, games 100% correct. But you know what you can see? You can see this. That I can see. Bang. Ball. You why is it a ball? Why, why is, is it a ball? ball? Why are we punishing the catcher for that? Because he took... 
what is clearly a ball. When his glove moves that much, that means it was a ball. No, it doesn't. Just because it ends up here does not mean it's a strike. They, they frame strikes, too. They frame strikes more into the you strike the, zone to assure that it's called a strike. Yes. Frame. Frame means that's a strike. This means it's a ball. So your answer is you want to give the umpires more power yeah, over balls and strikes. You're, I am trying, saying, to, you're trying to give more them to more power. I am saying if it is a pitch out and the catcher runs back and puts the ball inside the box, that's a ball. That doesn't make it a strike. Watch that's, Ryan Jeffers. That's frame. a made-up example. There's, yeah, no, that's there's, no, there's, no, there's no pitch outs that what are I, being framed for strikes. What I'm saying is Ryan Jeffers <laughs> would do it if he could. Watch, he, could watch, he should. Watch the games closely this weekend and watch his glove and watch the movement of that glove. It is in no way, shape, or form framing. I don't care what you call it. It works. Yeah. Okay. It statistically works. Right, but I'm, he's literally convert. He's well, one of I the best in baseball at it. I think Other catchers should learn from Ryan Jeffers. You are on the wrong side of history here. On this I think take. we're. I think we're ultimately <laughs> arguing the same thing. No, which we're is, not at th- all. This is more of a call for an electronic strike zone, because then yeah. it wouldn't matter. Because yeah, then we all of that, those yeah. all of those balls that Jeffers yanks his glove all around the zone for would be balls. I know, or they'd be strikes if they were in the zone. My final point on this is: so we agree that umpires aren't getting enough calls right, and we Correct. and we have the technology to fix this by putting in an electronic strike zone. Correct. And and your solution is: umpires are not living up to the expectation. So let's give them more power. And the ability to punish catchers that are trying to make a ball correctly called a strike. Um, what I'm saying is this: there used to be when I, I think when we started our show, Phil, there, there were pretty good pitch framing statistics of catchers who were good. And at that time, if you watched them, th- they were good because that's an art. Now it's become everyone and their brother yanking their glove around the zone. That's what it's okay, become. Okay, but if a, but let's say and I know there's this is a different sport. I love we're the like apples and oranges. Ten into a pitch yeah. framing argument. <laughs> It's Into June. the apples, oranges, compared. What else do we it's got? Uh, and the, the NBA draft did sort of uh, suck. I guess we so, talked about pull tabs for eight yeah, minutes on did. Draft for the Royce we did. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't know a thing about that. Different sport, and there's obviously there's review no for this. But yeah. this would be, Judd, what you're saying is to punish them. Let's say when a football player is close to the first down marker and he reaches for it, right? But his knee could be down beforehand. Yeah. And, and and you're now saying that we should we punish the player for reaching in front to try to get the extra spot and get the extra yard for yes, it? Yes, he's trying to trick the he's trying to trick the referee. Trying, trying to trick the referee. Punish the player. What I'm saying is Should we um, move the ball back five yards for him reaching? Pitch pitch finger painting is far more obvious. Just watch games watch games a couple of the next games that Jeffers catches and watch where the ball is caught and watch what he does with his arm. There's yeah, nothing well, subtle about it. Who cares? But okay, I just pulled it up here. Fangraphs actually has pitch framing, updated pitch framing stats. Right, which is the what four, I'm saying are flawed. The four well, no, they're not. The four the four best pitch framers in baseball this year, the guys who have who have given their team the most runs or value just through pitch framing mm-hmm. are Jose Trevino, the Yankees, Sean Murphy of the A's, Yadier Molina, who's a Hall of Famer. And Ryan Jeffers. Yeah. So whatever he's doing, whether you call it framing or relocating or drastically, wildly moving his glove around, right. it is working very well for the Twins. Mm-hmm. He's good at I, it. Yeah, and that's where I want the crackdown. <laughs> that's where I want the crackdown. Ryan, that ball's outside. Keep it outside. Don't bother because that's a ball. Ball one. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. All, All right. right, Spencer Crab via the scorner thap. Judd Zolgan sounds like a guy who is bored angry is good, by the way. I hope there's another thread based on this follow-up discussion that we just Me had too. for the last 15 minutes here. Uh, Spencer Crab via the scorner thap. I'm really starting to think the attendance is down at Target Field because we never know in advance the player scheduled rest games. I know this has stopped me a couple times this year from going to games. Um, the term worth the price of admission is very true to me. Last homestand versus the Guardians, I went to the Saturday game when Royce Lewis was at shortstop. Buxton didn't play. If I spend money to go with my friends and family, all due respect to guys like Celestino, there's more 25 jerseys than 67s. Yeah. Um, right. It's a real thing. Mm-hmm. When I, I hate to do this because I don't feel like I'm old enough to do this, but back when I was a kid in the 90s, Kirby Puckett was going to play. I went as a kid. I wanted to go see Kirby Puckett play in 1993 or whatever. And uh, Kirby Puckett 
was almost certainly going to be there playing. I don't remember a time. I'm trying to think. Like I, I don't remember going to a Twins game and not hearing Kirby Puckett. Okay. Well, no, he played home games. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. But at the he same time, I, I don't know what else they're supposed to do when Buxton has fluid drained from his knee. Like well, he's... I think on the Buxton one, it's become very, very difficult. So I, I almost, I feel for Buxton for sure, and I almost feel for the Twins on that one. Um, but in, for instance, the Saturday game that they sat Correa and Buxton, Correa, I don't think should sit that game. Like they, they played two days after that against Seattle, in Seattle. Okay, so like if you. Unless Correa's hurt. But if this is just, hey, it's a rest thing, wait two days. Like, I, I, where I'll side with the fans completely is I don't think it's fair to not know on Buxton, but I understand why they don't. But then they show up, and, you know, it costs a lot to go. $15 for parking, tickets aren't cheap, beers, food, concessions, and then you don't get Correa or Buxton? That no. seems to me to be not very fair. No. I've been to uh, eight Twins games so far in my 20-game package. I have seen Buxton and Correa in the lineup four times total. And only twice since opening week. Yeah. So since April, I have been to six Twins games, and only twice have I seen Buxton and Correa in the same starting yeah. lineup. It's a real thing. It's absolutely a real thing. Um, let's see here. Darren via the Scorner Thaps says, Enjoyed your list of Twins pitcher reclamation projects. Made me think of my favorite before your time, Phil and Declan, but Judd will remember Steve Carlton in 1987. Actually won a World Series ring, even though he wasn't on the playoff roster. Started seven games, went one and five with a 6.90 ERA. Hall of Famer, by the way, Steve Carlton. Even though he was terrible, way, way, way past his prime, it was cool having a Hall of Fame pitcher on the roster. Yeah, that's... He wasn't on my list because it was my favorites, and I didn't remember him because I was two, but... Yeah. Yeah. It's like 40-year-old Steve Carlton just hanging around, drinking beer after... Playoff wins. He came here and he was absolutely awful. But he also the, the famous twins Steve Carlton story was when they went to the White House. Then um, the next year to celebrate their World Series championship, Steve Carlton was identified as a Secret Service a agent in it, the, the photo because he had like dark glasses on and looked like a, and they didn't know Steve Carlton, so they <laughs> identified him as in the photo caption Secret Service. Agent watches the thing. It's like, no, that's actually Steve Carlton. In a, in a similar vein, it's probably better for uh, Purple Daily on Saturday's episode, but CBS Sports put out, you need a quarterback to run a two-minute drill, and who do you choose from this list? And it's all like fringe starter backup guys, and like <laughs> it's 16 of them. And some of the names are like, and a lot of them actually are Vikings players, but Keenum, Matt Castle, Jake Plummer, Cordell Stewart, Aaron Brooks, Jake. You basically have to take like a half good quarterback and which one of these guys do you trust to give you one two minute game winning drive it's actually a great great question so wait what so you want us to answer that right now i, I well we could answer now if we wanted to but i i kind of like i kind of like that a little purple daily talker yeah that's yeah. what i'm saying i, I, I want to think about that I'll, I'll put the graphic out to you too and then we, we can have a good discussion over this yeah uh, Kyle Lingstad via the scorner thap says i got a nomination for random twin of the week we should do that I like that. Should we do that? Should we do it? We do random Viking of the week. Should we do random? Do how about like random Minnesota athlete of the week or something? <laughs> no. Yeah. I'm going to add it to my notes here. Pretty fun. It's all the rage on uh, Purple Daily. He says, I'm, uh, I've am i been listening to you guys on a work trip this week in Korea. Went to a oh. baseball game Tuesday and Byung-ho Park started at first base. Wow. He went three for five with a double and a park bang home run that cleared park the bang. left field bleachers. Got back to the hotel and watched replays of his home run into the catch bar at Target Field and those other mammoth home runs. Uh, by the way, MLB could learn some things from the Korean League about having fun. We sat in the team cheering section and were up cheering and chanting half the game, especially when the home team was batting. It was over the top and kind of distracting at times, but definitely fun. Hard to describe, but like dance cheerleaders from basketball, uh, Saints mascots leading cheers, and the intensity of a college student section combined into one. Would you guys enjoy... Major League Baseball games more if there was just more animated cheering and things. Like you go to, you know, we watch international soccer games or even go to Minnesota United games and you see whole sections of people. Or do you just kind of want to sit there and chill? No, I think it would have to be, well, one, if it was, I think it would need, need to be a little bit more organic. So like if the twins were like, we've got this section where you have to stand up and cheer, I don't know that that works. But if it's fan based and organic, I think it does work. I, for the most part, don't have a, a lot of time 
for the actual World Baseball Classic. But the one thing that's really cool is how much fun people from other countries have during baseball. Like, we wander around, drink some beers, leave, get bored, right? Um, I feel like countries besides ours that embrace this sport have a lot more fun and it's cool. I think it's a way of engagement that we don't have now. So yeah, I think it'd be fun. Yeah, I would love it. I think I remember in 2010 when the twins were playing the Yankees at target fields, the first playoff series at target field. And I think it was game one. If I recall, I was covering these games in the press box. And I remember watching people in the legends club, trying to stand up and cheer and just get into the game and stuff. And then the other half of people were telling those people to sit down. I think, I don't know if that's a Minnesota thing or if it's just an American sports thing, but it's like, ah, just sit, let's sit down and, and watch the game. It's like, oh, it's a playoff game. If people want to stand up, get loud. Sometimes I just want to chill and hang out regular season, baseball game, yeah. target field skyline. Yeah, if we're playing the Royals, degrees, you know. please sit down. You know, like I, I don't, I don't need, I don't need to get us pumped up. Like we, we don't need that. But if we're, it's a Yankees game or it's a big time moment, you know, Rocco pulling Duran for Caleb Thielbar, get up and get a little loud and get, get, get pissed off. That's fine. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so, all right, that's Feedback Friday here on Mackie and Judd, presented by our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. You can always send us via the Score North app. By the way, we're uh, we still have a week left on the Purple Daily Getaway to Miami. We're given. A pair of tickets to one winner, week six. We'll cover the tickets, lower level tickets, Minnesota, Miami. We'll cover the travel cost, the hotel. So all you have to do, it's free to to sign up. Download the Score North app, open it, register, and enter through listener rewards. So uh, looking forward to sending a couple people. Uh, on the Federated front, they've been helping businesses for over 100 years, based in Owatonna, Minnesota. And uh, they're all about risk management tools and resources to help maximize the success of your business. Find out more at federatedinsurance.com where it's our business to protect yours. All right. Did we frame up that episode in the way that uh, was acceptable there, uh, you, Judd? You did a nice job. Did you frame but I it mean, up okay? You know what? The fact that Latroy Hawkins and I are on the side of God means something here. Does it? I, I feel like Latroy and Dick Bramer is a, oftentimes an awkward pairing in the broadcast booth. I don't, yeah, it is. I don't sense that there's a lot of chemistry between those guys. <laughs> It was like when uh Tory Hunt when they had Tory with him a few times that was like super awkward there and even like Tory got uh, like a, a cheeky a few times with Dick Bramer and he was talking about injuries and there's like a viral clip that goes around that Bramer was playing like medical doctor and Tory Hunter just like claps going oh thanks Doctor Dick like yeah. it just it, it shut <laughs> but it that was, was awesome I, it was I, good. I, loved, I loved it because Tory would Tory would you know would challenge him yeah. <laughs> I, I think the Hawk, I think where Phil's right about the Hawk is I think the Hawk is, is super baseball smart, clearly. Um, I don't the think Hawk. he, I don't think the Hawk has as much time. Like, like, Tory lived to chide, I think. So, like, he loved that. I think <laughs> Latroy is more like, yeah, whatever, man. Yeah, he's a he's an interesting person now. We've had him on, we had a spring training a couple of times. Like, really nice guy, but also just, I don't know. He's got a really dry sense of humor, and so you can't tell if he's kidding sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it uh, if well, it connects well with Mr. Bramer, but last thing too, and the Cleveland broadcast just called Miguel Sano fat. They they, they didn't even hold which back is, at all, which is hilarious, but wrong. He did yeah. have knee surgery, <laughs> so it was like, it was like it was from from the was that three four years back now where he got sent to Fort Myers in June because he yes. was fat. Can we like, confirm yeah. that that clip was from this? I think it was from yesterday. Series? Okay. I think it was from yesterday, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it was very weird because it was like he was talking, it, it was like the Cleveland broadcaster. I think it, it was uh, Pat's friend, right? Tom H- Hamilton? I think it was oh. Tom Hamilton. But it was very odd because, yeah, it was like he was talking about that. He's like, he's just fat. It's like, all right, I'm not a certainly a Sano stan or supporter, but yeah, that's just not Well, at what right. point is he recovered from the knee surgery and he's just down there to get back in baseball shape? Are we are we kind of transitioning to that point here? He's been on the injured list for quite a while, and wasn't it? Do we know it, it was the short term version, right? It's the one that kind of knocks you out for a few weeks. He was yeah, supposed to be back in like four to six weeks. Yeah. Yes, I think you're correct. Yeah. But I mean, there's no place for him. That's the other problem. Yeah. Like what? Like what? Where's he going to play? DH. They got guys that can DH. I think he's just a. He, he's. He could kind of a part time DH bench bat late in the game. Yes. You know, sit down there in the cage and get warmed up for your ninth inning at bat. I don't know. Oh. But uh, that's a wrap on Feedback Friday here. Be sure to check out on Purple Daily 
the final five of Judd's top 25 Vikings of all time. See you guys.